Welcome to Creative Innovators with Gigi Johnson. I was so pleased to have Megan Elliott on the show. She is out in Lincoln, Nebraska, but she's working with people globally to help build next generation pirates, magicians, and wizards in the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media. She's built a program from scratch, but with the support of many organizations, companies, and folks at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. But she has an amazing history in Australia, working with indigenous culture, in contemporary art, traveling throughout Asia and Europe, putting together X Media Lab. She has an amazing, I guess the word used to be called Rolodex, list of fabulous people and collaborators. But she's taken that magic and built a whole new program that you'll enjoy. When and how did we meet, do you recall? Uh, I think it would have been through the AFI Digital Lab. I think ah. that must have been how it was. And that that I do remember that dinner after Digital Hollywood because I was trying out your Google Glass. <laughs> Back when I was a glass hall. And nowadays all that <laughs> stuff doesn't work all that well and yet we're, you know, all sorts of new derivations of technology. And I was fascinated at what you were doing at bringing thought leaders around to other countries. But I'm I'm coming in probably late in the journey. Where did you get started with media and technology? What does your journey path start with? My journey path actually starts with performance and contemporary art way back in the day. But to launch into the technological side, that was actually when I met Brendan Harkin, when I was the executive director of the Australian Writers Guild, and he was from the future. He was from the internet. And um, and he and his internet friends and mobile friends in particular thought that they were going to take over the world. And I just said, but you can't because your stories aren't compelling. And so it became like this perfect Venn diagram, which became Cross Media Lab, where he was the internet in the future and I was all of the content creators. So um, that's how it all began, really, in about 2004. So what type of contemporary art? Uh, what we nowadays called uh, immersive and interactive theatre. So we were a bunch of rebels, although we were funded by the Australia Council for the Arts in their very first what they called then hybrid arts grant. And we made site-specific performers performances all over the country. We'd work with community groups. We made huge machines that spat fire. We built three-storey sculptures. Um, we took people on incredible journeys. We stole their shoes. There was probably nudity at some point, but um, it was a riot. It was an absolute riot. And what I'm loving about the time just prior to COVID was uh, how rich the world of immersive theatre had become again and that now we were actually being uh, uh, actually having business models for it because there were no business models in the early 90s except for funding from government. So... I'm going to take you back even further, back into prehistoric times. Were you an artist as a child and were your parents in the arts? No, my parents were definitely not in the arts, although my mother was a school teacher and believed in creativity in the arts, so encouraged us um, to engage with all kinds of things, theatre, poetry, Australian literature, you know, going to plays, being in school plays. Uh, so... But they didn't consider it to be a real job at all. So I actually studied um, applied science in cultural heritage management at university, which was a degree designed for Indigenous people. Um, and they let non-Indigenous people like myself in on interview. And part of the reason for that is that I'd always grown up in uh, Indigenous communities with Indigenous culture in Australia. And I really wanted to be part of the retelling of their stories in a post-colonial way. Um, so which and we can get to a bit later. It's Weirdly, I've, I've ended up in a place in Nebraska where that's possible again. Yeah. I was just thinking that this is a, a, an intriguing echo of, of getting back into uh, people's own stories and, and storytelling and, and new ah, – just fascinating. Okay. So I don't want to distract myself from this conversation because this is so wonderful. Uh, so you finished college and you had this unique degree – and then what did you do? What was your first step out? 
Uh, I well, my first step out was actually um, curate, not curating, but kind of executing on actually an indigenous contemporary art um, exhibition uh, in Canberra, the capital of Australia, where I'd gone to university. And then I moved to Sydney to work at Performance Space, which is Australia's centre for the research and development of contemporary art, which is where I discovered HTML and VNS Matrix and um, you know, everything that was starting to happen within early net art then. Um, Mackenzie Walk was hanging around uh, the theorist. So so that's that's when I started. And, and I still am connected to many of those people. And from that period of time, for example, Lynette Walworth was hanging around and she was very much an analogue artist then. And now, of course, she's just won an Emmy for um, a webinar, her VR experience. So it was a really fertile and creative time. And and a lot of those people have gone on to have these incredibly rich international and, and important careers. I dropped out of that because I wanted to change the world and I was starting to have doubts that the arts could do it. So I decided I need to be, needed to be a trade unionist. So I went off and was selected to be, you know, the youth leadership of the Australian trade union movement and was um, mentored and then worked in the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. So I ended up being a trade unionist or an industrial organiser for um, for performance artists and country musicians and, and did that for a number of years until I took off to Europe for a while, working there actually with the um, National Union of Ireland, Galway and SIP2, which is their trade unions movement, and, um, and then came back to Australia and landed up working at the Australian Writers Guild where I quickly became the executive director. And so there it was like the trade union for writers. So I looked after and represented all of Australia's writers across film, theatre and television. Now is And then is, games, actually. I introduced the idea of writing for games as part of that journey. In Australia, is, is trade unionism in the arts more prevalent than here? Here being the US, um, I'm talking. We're both talking yeah. it from a US point of view, though. This is listened to all over the place. Uh, look, I think within the creative industries, yes. I mean, the guild like Actors' Equity is as important there as it is here. You know, the Australian Writers Guild was then affiliated, uh, part of the international affiliation of Writers Guild, so that we interfaced with, you know, the WGA East and West all the time. Um, I mean, I haven't lived in Australia for a long time now, so I'm not sure where it's up to. A lot of the work that tra that the guilds in particular, the Directors Guild, the Screen Producers Association and ourselves, was actually around lobbying for um, content quotas on television. Just think of it, <laughs> content quotas on television before the age of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping content and the audiovisual and creative industries out of bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements. And actually, ironically, I was um, instrumental in Australia, uh, that whole group was, to argue against um, content and audiovisual content being part of the Australia-US free trade agreement. Um, but on the back end of that, that's when they... Um, created these e weird E3 visas for Australians to come to America and that's that's how I've ended up here. So, <laughs> so you kind of generated your own fuel to, to end up with yes, this role. Yes, in a way. But it's, but it's interesting because I, I love explaining the kind of, um, well, back then, the which is changing, of course, with streaming, but that kind of the economic, um, you know, how things are distributed and the international distribution model and why it's so important for people to see themselves on screens um, and why countries like Australia or the UK or Korea or um, not the UK actually but um, France and New Zealand, why it's so important that we do have content quotas so that we can get our stories on screens. And I think I really took that ethos, which probably goes back to my mother who insisted that we read Australian authors as kids and not just American or English authors. Um, but it's that led to Cross Media Lab, which was all about, you know, Malaysians getting Malaysian content on screens, whether or not it was their a big silver screen or their mobile phone screen, but but having yourself reflected back at you. And I still think that's really important. And it still probably is what lights my fire um, when I get up in Lincoln, Nebraska to run the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts. So let's let's finish talking though about X Media Lab. So you were connecting disparate people and talent. What was that adventure like? 
wild. Um, it was it's actually really extraordinary, and I sometimes I wonder how Brendan and I did it, how we had the the sheer resilience and guts to do it <laughs> because we weren't backed by anyone. Um, we did it as two people, and we you know we went to Singapore and we set up in a um, in a single room and we we built this business that we took to 14 countries in 22 cities around the world like we kind of got in a plane and went to Beijing and started knocking on doors um, uh, specifically at the Beijing Film Academy um, to talk about how we were um, helping people to create their own IP uh, and to bring economic development at that point in time China wasn't so interested in that they were interested in becoming better at work for hire but then um then within a year or two they were really interested in that so we actually started the china animation market in suzhou which is a city just outside of shanghai um back then it was an hour and a half drive now it's 20 minutes on the fast train and and we kept doing that and i think what was so unique about us was that for us for example on stage at the sydney opera house or um or, or in Switzerland, for us it was just situation normal to have a Chinese person next to an Indian person, next to a Swiss person, next to somebody from Hollywood, somebody from the UK, um, speaking as equals and introducing um, introducing the West to the East many times. And I can remember way back when, you know, when I was so proud to have Nokia as a sponsor, and we had the chief games designer for Nokia, and a, a you know C-suite exec in the room in Mumbai, having to learn about cricket and Hanuman the monkey god because those were the themes that Indian mobile game developers wanted to make mobile games about. So that was um, that was incredible, intensely pleasurable to see these stories and um, games and themes start to. To have start to have an international stage. You have done so much and so much diverse work, and then you take up the baton after a search to launch a completely new immersive media center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Can you share how you started that journey and what you? didn't know when you started that you've learned since? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was approached, keep your, my, my takeaway today, keep your LinkedIn profile up to date. I was approached by Corn Ferry through LinkedIn um, and asked if I was interested and I thought they just wanted access to my, net, my network. But then they kept asking me, no, no, are you interested? So I said, sure, send it over. And, um, and when I read it, I was... I just was. I found it so compelling, partly because of its commitment to the the vision's commitment to interdisciplinarity. But I should back up. the The Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts is made possible by a twenty million dollar gift from the Johnny Carson Foundation. Johnny, of course, is a television icon and entrepreneur, and magician, uh, and the university. And so it's combined to be about a fifty seven million dollar investment. And what they want was to develop a center and a, an undergraduate initially program, which lived right at the nexus of creativity and technology and was about the emerging media arts. So they didn't want a traditional film or animation school. They wanted something about the emerging media arts. And I when I was being interviewed, I really pressed hard on that because I said, if you are interested in a traditional film and television school, I'm not I'm not your right hire. And um, and they, they said, no, 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 we're interested in the emerging media arts. And so, um, so they found me and the vision to me was compelling because it wasn't just about telling stories or using emerging media within the context of the entertainment industries, but in recognition that media is an industry building industry and we're part of every industry. And f while my mission is to s ensure that that all of my students are either to able to be able to realise their dream job or raise money to start their dream company straight out of school. For us to be successful, we don't just want, we do want, we do want students to go off and be, you know, rock stars in Shanghai and Paris and Los Angeles and Atlanta. We do want that. And we also want students to be rock stars and to build businesses here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so 
yeah, so that's what's driving me right now. You've taken a long journey to create magic. <laughs> that the that university creating something means that you've got to plant the seed of curriculum design. You've got to get approvals. You've got a, phys a physical facility being created. And you've gone through all that journey, but coming from outside higher education, what were the the chunks in the road that you had to step over or make happen? Well, a lot, of course, had happened prior to my arrival, like the gift had been given, a uh, certain, you know, um, contract had been made that this centre was going to be built in and it was X amount of students in X amount of timeline. So I came in and they didn't, the, the Johnny Carson Foundation themselves didn't really want a traditional hire. They wanted someone from industry. And while that has made things, while that has caused some friction because I don't neatly fit into what is very hierarchical in, in higher education, um, what's so magical about the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is that, and the Johnny Carson Foundation, is that everyone wants us to win. So it's like the Chancellor wants us to win, the community, the Lord Mayor, they all want us to win because when we win and are successful, they're also successful. So, and the other thing I I felt, and Norm um, Holland, uh, who was a brilliant <gasps> advisor, I know, <laughs> a brilliant advisor to our um, to us and a, and a personal mentor of mine, he he saw it straight away when the when the um, Carson Center brought him on as a consultant. Is that the, the there are very few silos here? It is actually deeply collaborative, and um, you know people say we'll figure it out, we'll help you. And they told me when I arrived to treat it like a startup, and so I did. And then I I very. Uh, fortunate that in the dean's office at the, the Hicks and Lead College of Fine and Performing Arts is that when I didn't fill out the right forms or when I didn't do something, they filled out the forms for me later. <laughs> and and I think they knew that I had such a Herculean task and it wasn't just me at all, it's a team of people, but we had to do so much in such a short amount of time that they just had to they just had to suck it up. That you know <laughs> that she didn't fill out the right form at the at the right time. She put all of this stuff on her credit card and now needs to be reimbursed. Um, because if I waited for the traditional um, university, you know, um, I don't know permissions, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, so yeah. So so there's a lot to learn, and I I wasn't prepared. And and also my goodness, the whole notion of shared governance. When you run a startup, there's no shared governance. It's like you know, if you're not doing your job, get off. <laughs> but, right. but at a university dealing with tenured professors, um, you know, of course that whole it's it's very very different. And um, it, that took me a while to. I, I wish I'd worked that out a little bit earlier. I wish I'd shut up a little bit more and listened a lot more or asked more questions right at the beginning. But um, but we are where we are, and um, and we're in a great place. You know, it, just in the last twelve months or 15, eighteen months, I've hired five new people. Um, we've recruited our second cohort of students. We're about to change the curriculum. Um, because we very much recognise that the degree we put through first was brilliant, but it was a prototype. Uh, we would need to change it as we hired the people who were going to teach it. So we're about to go through that process, which is exciting because we're about to kind of break it apart and make it a little bit more open and flexible. Um, so it's it's continuing to to iterate, just like a, a small business, like a startup should. Well, I was very appreciative of being able to look in over the edge of, of the curtain as things were coming together and, and watching the great minds you brought from various parts of immersive media to talk about what was really needed and what could be done. Can you talk a little bit about the initial curriculum design that you had? Because it was, uh, I was going to say, very unique, the approach to bring so many different things together. <laughs> I, did, I basically started to do a, a mini cross media lab where the um, where the curriculum was the project in the room. So I bought, I established an advisory council of international luminaries, uh, which included people like Alex McDowell from the World Building Institute, Ted Shilowitz, the futurist at Paramount Pictures, Madeline Donono, who's the CEO of the Gina Davis. Um, 
Institute for Gender Equity in Media and the president of the Television Academy Foundation, the Beijing Film Academy. And I brought a bunch of these folks to Lincoln to talk about what are the emerging media arts and what is needed in industry. And then I locked them and faculty and some students actually away in a room for a day and a half to actually you know, what I call put the bones onto the curriculum. Like what do they need to know? How how do they need to be able to think? What do they need to be able to make when they when they get out after four years? And after that, letting that kind of settle and process and do more and more research, we engaged in what I called curriculum sprints, which are very similar to, you know, a programming sprint, sprint or design sprint. And along the way, I read and interviewed a bunch, hundreds, I don't know, many, many people and had other people do the same. And I was deeply affected by uh, the book Robot Proof, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And what Joseph Owen argues there is that for us to thrive, uh, then we need to develop four new cognitive capacities and they are uh, critical thinking, systems thinking, entrepreneurship and cultural agility and in the creation of this curriculum we mapped those four cognitive capacities we mapped critical thinking to design systems thinking to computational media and code entrepreneurship and cultural agility to storytelling and then we've used those four um, pillars if you will as the foundation from which to build our course and so students when they first come in they do a whole year of story so a whole year of writing across and working across every platform and speculative design and world building they do a whole year of visual expression and design and a whole year of computational media um, from coding through to physical computing and then from there they branch off to do their emphasis um, around you know immersive and interactive media or data and art or sonic arts or cinema arts experience design um, and, and from there they graduate and one hopes they go off and build companies or, or get you know terrific jobs and so it's, it's quite an unusual approach to um, to building a curriculum but I wanted to build something that meant that our students would get work that they would be that they would be critical creative leaders in industry not just cogs in a wheel mm -hmm. so you build this magic box and who showed up because part of it is you can design you can market you can show but the people who then step in to populate both as students and as faculty then put then the proof to the pudding so what kids Shut up. So the first students that showed up um, were people who still knew that there was a film program here. It was a, it was a been going on for twenty years. It was a great program. It was a um, but it was a very small program, and it was actually a bachelor of the a bachelor of fine arts in theatre with an emphasis in film and new media. So it was still people who wanted to tell stories on screens. But also I think, you know, I'm a girl from the bush and I only knew what I knew when I went to university and it wasn't very much because I was a first in family. My mother had gone to teacher's college. So um, so it's been interesting watch the eyes, you know, light up when they see what else is possible um, from 3D printing their own iPad cases to creating, you know, podcasts to using Unity as, as a the Unity game engine to make movies in, to recreating the Carson Centre inside Mozilla Hubs. So their eyes have been widened. And I think as we as we go for, you know, as we become better known, I think that our population of students will change. And, and we're still seeing that now. We're seeing students going, oh, computer science or emerging media arts, mechanical engineering or emerging media arts architecture or emerging media arts so um so that's exciting and yes the program is changing because i've hired five new professors as i said we've had long-standing professors in um, traditional cinema editing documentary and animation and now i've hired um people who work uh with intelligent machines, with machine learning, who work in interactive and immersive media, who develop incredible sonic soundscapes, um, who work across all different platforms. One of our professors right now, I, I like to think of, well, I like to think of all of them as professors by day and they kind of become superheroes of an evening. And um, Professor Anna Henson's superhero right now is that she's um, she's in 
she's a host inside Lovecraft Country's uh, very um, uh, elite and invitation only um, VR chat experience. So I think last night when she was in there, she was hosting Janelle Monet to give a concert uh, inside the VR chat for uh, Lovecraft Country. So yeah, so so they're now getting to, and the whole the whole reason that these really brilliant young professors came here um, from Brown, from Carnegie Mellon, from Stanford, from UCSD, is because they want to be on the ground floor of building something themselves. So you know, I think any and all of our professors, all of them have industry experience actually. And so what's so great about this opportunity is that you get to, you get to be like you're in a startup and incredibly innovative, but you know that you've got to get a paycheck every week and you've got a big R1 research institution behind you. So what have been your joyful surprises at this process? Oh, oh so many. I love, I lo- I love meeting our students. Um, I miss them terribly during COVID, not seeing them here all the time. Um, a, I think a joyful surprise was that initial that initial realisation is that everyone's on our side. You know, I mean, sure, it's hard, change is hard and there are going, there's going to be pain points, absolutely. It, it hasn't been pretty and rosy all the, all the way. But, but just knowing that, that the Chancellor's got my back, that the Dean's got my back, that the Carson Foundation have my back, you know, to really support, to be, to be bold and to be visionary, that's really exciting and kind of exceptional. And then another wonderful experience is almost by dint of accident uh, the dance program is in our building so we're the only undergraduate program in the country where dance is physically housed inside of emerging media arts center and so much of our work is in our screens so that when you walk into the center you see these bodies and all kinds of bodies all different of different sizes different colors different abilities moving in space and I think that that is it impacts our students' work and our faculty's work. And interestingly, out of just except for, out of the eight faculty we currently have, only two of them have kind of only worked with dance tangentially. Everyone else is engaged with choreography, movement, performance. Um, we know we're all there's a huge interest around embodiment and what that means in extended reality and investigating that. So I'm really excited about the potential of collaboration and around embodied learning and um you know I cheekily refer to dance as embodied media so so that's been really it's a real delight and something that I'm really looking forward to investigating I'm trying not to make every episode talk about the COVID challenges but has has your program been oddly ready for creating in this experience from home environment? Yeah, I think, I mean, we were so fortunate that all of our students had their own laptops because the Johnny Carson Foundation generously provided each student with a laptop and they are all powerful enough for the students to have a virtual background if they need to or wish to. Um, so, so yes, that, that's been, that's great. And everyone's been so flexible and I think, um, and then when I see the students who come in because they want to be in community with each other, you know, they do sit six foot apart, they have their masks on, they sanitise their hands, they, you know, disinfect their learning spaces. Um, it's, they're incredibly responsible because people want to keep coming to university um, if they're not immunocompromised and staying at home. We, we checked with everyone about um, their internet bandwidth, who else was using it, what was the capacity, because we do have some students that were in, were sent back to rural Nebraska where it's all via satellite. So, but we, we yes, I mean, I think we're much more advanced, for example, than perhaps, you know, a stereotypical philosophy professor or, you know, some some places realize that some of their professors didn't even have laptops or computers. And I would say that's in my, you know, that's so. in our shop as well. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of though that, that, yeah it's a world to be creating into that is potentially much more open and or obsessed with 
immersive media? Is that changing the world your students are developing into and ways to experiment in a now much more, well, other than maybe picking up the same, same thing you're just saying, that we've, we're in a broader spectrum of social abilities and readiness so that you have people who don't have internet at home and don't have a working laptop uh, who are also your consumers that you're designing for, as well as people now who are building whole new immersive media platforms to accommodate what's happening now. Is that kind of change the world you guys are shaping into? Yes. Um, yes. And I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to what it is we take from this time and bring into that next world that we're designing, um, that we, we will get to bring into being if there ever is a time that's post COVID. I mean, that's not a guarantee. Um, so, so the answer to that is yes. I think, but it's also learning about ourselves physiologically and the kinds of cognitive dissonance or fatigue that we can feel um, by seeing ourselves and others on screen all the time. So what are the other learning spaces online that we can inhabit? Um, how do we take care of ourselves outside of the screen? These are all questions that, that we're currently um, exploring and, and with our students too. So we started the conversation and we're actually getting the near, near the end of our time together, but we started the conversation about you as engaged in arts and indigenous work. Are you doing creative work yourself? And then what is the opportunity for indigenous type work in Lincoln, Nebraska? Great question. I think I do see actually building and generating the Johnny Carson Centre for Emerging Media Arts as an incredibly as incredibly creative work. So, and it's that is totally all I have time for. Um, the a, a brilliant thing about Lincoln, Nebraska is actually Vision Maker Media is here, and Vision Maker Media is the organisation that funds um, Indigenous documentaries on PBS. And they are fierce. They're a fantastic organisation. And so I'm. we also have the Centre for Great Plains here. And so I'm actively exploring with them um, projects that we could do together. I just actually had a brilliant conversation a couple of weeks ago with Romaine, Dr. Romaine Morton, who is uh, the head of First Nations and Outreach at the Australian Film Television Radio School. Um, and they have done some remarkable work where they've taken uh, almost a policy document which was developed by Screen Australia, which is the film funding agency, and they've turned that into curriculum so that any kind of filmmaker, television maker, it guides them how to work with Indigenous peoples, with Indigenous stories, with Indigenous images, culture, and also on Indigenous country. And so I'm interested in in catching up with um, Vision Maker Media to see if that's something that they might be interested in us piloting and, and exploring here. Um, and also I was, when I, and Romaine and I have known each other for a long time. She used to actually bring brilliant um, digital media projects into Cross Media Lab. Uh, one was a, a Welcome to Country app where you could go anywhere in the world and you would get an Indigenous Welcome to Country, you know, from where you were located. Um, anyway, so Romaine, I was talking to Romaine about embodiment, like I'd mentioned in this podcast before, and she said, Megan, Indigenous cosmologies are embodied. You know, we didn't write them down. They're in our bodies. And my mind just blew and we just started. So, so we're, we're, we're looking at... Um, at some kinds of collaborations, but it's, it's kind of early days yet. I, I want to get faculty hired, the, the curriculum worked out, and then to have a solid grounding to, to launch off on some other projects, including actually a conference slash festival, the opportunity to start something new here, um, which is, is really exciting. And of course, COVID changes that completely. It doesn't necessarily only need to be here anymore. Right. Wow, you have done and are doing so much. As we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to mention we have not talked about? Um, yes, uh, if people are listening and they're interested in partnering with us in any um, in any capacity, I'd love to hear from them. If they have, I say that I'm recruiting the pirates, magicians, and wizards of the world. So if they know of any, send them my way to chat. 
we're, we're interested in, we, we, we actually recruit students from all over the country. And we're also, our, our learning is all project-based learning. So if people have projects that they would like wizards and magicians and pirates of the world to work on, I'd love to hear from you, um, or internships that you'd like to provide them. So we're very student-centric, uh, student-focused, but also industry and and partner very closely with industry so so please reach out and um you can reach me at uh carsoncenter.unl.edu um megan.elliot at unl.edu i'm sure gg you could pop something in the show notes absolutely i'll put both of those in the show, show notes and a lot of the other wonderful things that you've commented on this incredibly diverse conversation. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. I've appreciated uh, both coming back to connect and then hearing more about your past and current adventures. Thank you so much. It was such an honor. Well, that was Megan. (laughs) What an amazing story she has of connecting anything from indigenous culture in Australia contemporary art, ex-media labs, and now the building of the Johnny Carson Center. Would you like to connect with Megan? We have all the information in the show notes. Please share this episode with people that you would find would potentially want to go to this fabulous program, teach in it, or work with these really great students. Think about what you can do with your life if you start mixing and matching with magicians. Thanks for listening to the episode, and we will see you next time on Creative Innovators with Gigi Johnson.